Welcome to session four of Bursting Wineskins. I am Gary Peluso Verden, the Executive Director of the Center for Religion and Public Life at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa. All men were created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Although in the context of the Declaration, all men may have meant any nation, as in Americans have a right to self-determination just as the people of Great Britain do. After the Revolution, Jefferson's words were taken to mean every individual person has those rights. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. But oneness or equality in a religious sense has not translated into equality in either church or society. In fact, church leaders have historically been at the forefront of preserving social hierarchy with white men at the top. But church leaders have at times fomented and sometimes led reform and even revolution in regard to those hierarchies. The word hierarchy derives from two Greek words which together mean sacred order or sacred rule. Regardless of one's religious or moral commitments, to invoke a hierarchy of persons, groups, or values is to create a hierarchy. Throughout American history and American Christian history, hierarchies have been both defended and attacked with every physical, spiritual, and intellectual weapon available. People have died to preserve hierarchy, and people have died to dismantle a hierarchy in hope of more equality. This week I'm going to spend most of my time introducing or reintroducing you to speeches used to fight for and against hierarchy. You'll see how, in the minds of defenders of hierarchy, one can have both equality and hierarchy, liberty and status. You will also be reminded that Christians can advocate powerfully for equality, an advocacy which is always dangerous because equality advocates are violating the so-called natural sacred order of things. Today I'm going to deal with two of many possible hierarchies, the hierarchy of race and color and the hierarchy of men over women, also known as patriarchy. I'll start with racial and color hierarchies first. And first up, Ben Franklin. America did not invent hierarchies of race and color, but we have certainly developed them. In the second week lecture, I read from Cotton Mather's sermon on the duties of slaves to masters and masters to slaves. In that sermon, Mather equated blackness with evil. Well, listen to Franklin's observations about why America ought to be for white peoples. This is from Ben Franklin, 1751. Which leads me, he says, to add one remark, that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. All Africa is black or tawny, Asia chiefly tawny, America exclusive of the newcomers, wholly so. And in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion as are the Germans also, the Saxons only accepted, who with the English make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth. I could wish their numbers were increased. And while we are, as I may call it, scouring our planet by clearing America of woods and so making this side of the globe reflect a brighter light to the eyes of inhabitants in Mars or Venus, why should we, in the sight of superior beings, darken its people? Why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America, where we have so fair an opportunity, by excluding all blacks and tawnies, of increasing the lovely white and red? But perhaps I am partial to the complexion of my own country, for such kind of partiality is natural to mankind. Ah, the, naturalists of birds of a, uh, the naturalness of birds of a feather that flock together in the church growth lingo of a few decades ago, the homogeneous unit principle. Note that Franklin is making his argument more based on color than on race per se. Race becomes a much more important category leading up to and after the Civil War. Now, here's a more developed racial hierarchy. The following is from an 1861 speech given by James 
Henry Thornwell at the founding of the Confederate version of the Presbyterian Church. Let's see how much of what he says hinges on divinely established social hierarchy. The policy of slavery's existence or non-existence is a question which exclusively belongs to the state. We have no right as a church to enjoin it as a duty or to condemn it as a sin. Our business is with the duties which spring from the relation, the duties of the master on the one hand and the slaves on the other. Here you see echoes of Cotton Mather, an argument for separating the religious realm from the political, uh, if entrance to the political involves change. Well, these duties we are to proclaim and to enforce with spiritual sanctions. The social, civil, civil political problems connected with this great subject transcend our sphere. As God had not entrusted his church, the organization of society, the construction of governments, nor the allotment of individuals to their various stations. Uh, now, now note this last statement about people's places in the hierarchy. Now we venture to assert that if men had drawn their conclusions upon this subject only from the Bible, it would no more have entered into any human head to denounce slavery as a sin than to denounce monarchy, aristocracy, or poverty. The truth is men have listened to what they falsely considered as primitive institutions or as necessary deductions from primitive cognitions and then have gone to the Bible to confirm their crotchets of their vain philosophy. They have gone there determined to find a particular result and the consequence is that they leave having made instead of having interpreted scripture. Slavery is no new thing. It has not only existed for ages in the world, it's existed under every dispensation of the covenant of grace in the church of God. <laughs> and this is me now. Wow, you know, that's a lot. Affirmation of the hierarchies of monarchy over democracy, aristocracy over social leveling, and rich over poor. Back to this speech. But apart from all this, the law of love is simply the inculcation of universal equity. It implies nothing as to the existence of various ranks and gradations in society. The interpretation which makes it repudiate slavery would make it equally repudiate all social, civil, and political inequalities. Its meaning is not that we should conform ourselves to the arbitrary expectations of others, but that we should render unto them precisely the same measure which, if we were in their circumstance, it would be reasonable and just in us to demand at their hands. It condemns slavery, therefore, only upon the supposition that slavery is a sinful relation that is, he who extracts the prohibition of slavery from the golden rule begs the very point in dispute. And this be again, again, an argument for hierarchy that allows for slavery, the golden rule, and all other social hierarchies. One is to practice the law of love as fitting in every social, social rank. Just if practice law of love, social ranks are good. Indeed, as we contemplate their condition in the southern states and contrast it with that of their fathers before them and that of their brother in the present in their native land, we cannot but accept it as a gracious providence that they have brought, been brought in such numbers to our shores and redeemed from the bondage of barbarism and sin. Slavery to them has certainly been overruled for the greatest good. It has been a link in the wondrous chain of providence through which many sons and daughters have been made heirs of the heavenly inheritance. Me again here, chain of providence is very close, the medieval chain of being. The providential result is, of course, no justification if the thing is intrinsically wrong, but it is certainly a matter of devout thanksgiving and no obscure in, intima, intimation of the will and purpose of God and consequent duty of the church. We cannot forbear to say, however, that the general operation of the system is kindly and benevolent. It is a real and effective discipline. And without it, we are profoundly persuaded that the African race in the midst of us can never be elevated in the scale of being. Note again, scale of being. <laughs> as long as that race, in its comparative degradation, coexists, side by side with the white, bondage is its normal condition. And this is me here, and here comes a paragraph which is antithetical to the Declaration of Independence, which locates rights as given by God and not by the state when he writes, 
As to the endless declamation about human rights, we have only to say that human rights are not a fixed but a fluctuating quantity. Their sum is not the same in any two nations on the globe. The rights of Englishmen are one thing, the rights of Frenchmen another. There is a minimum without which a man cannot be responsible. There is a maximum which expresses the highest degree of civilization of Christian culture. The education of the species consists in its ascent along this line. Now, this can hear the increase of rights linked to one's place in God's chain of being. As you go up, the number of rights increases, but the number of individuals who possess them diminishes. As you come down the line, rights are diminished, but individuals are multiplied. Well, one can hear separate but equal, and women must be free to fulfill their duties as they have rights within the ranks on God's societal ladder in Mr. Thornwell's words. Now, jump forward a century. One of the most famous white supremacist speeches in modern history was given by jo Governor George Wallace. Here's a segment of Wallace's Segregation Forever speech delivered at his inauguration as governor in January 1963. Today I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is very appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very heart of the great Anglo-Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom as we have our generations of forebears before us, time and again through history. Always ask what we means, by the way. With Wallace, we here is definitely white people. <clears throat> Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny. And I say, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. It's me here. Now, what is that tyranny? That the government may back the civil rights mo movement and complete the work of reconstruction undermined decades earlier by the ancestor of the people Wallace addressed, that's tyranny. Back to Wallace, we intend quite simply to practice the free heritage as bequeathed to us as sons of free fathers. We intend to revitalize the truly new and progressive form of government that is less than 200 years old, a government first founded in this nation simply and purely on faith, that there is a personal God who rewards good and punishes evil, that hard work will receive its just desserts, that ambition and ingenuity and incentiveness and profits of such are admirable traits and goals, that the individual is encouraged in his spiritual growth and from that growth arrives at a character that enhances his charity toward others and from that character and that charity so is influenced business and labor and farm and government. The liberals theory that poverty, discrimination and lack of opportunity is the cause of communi communism is a false theory. If it were true, the South would have been the biggest single communist bloc in the Western Hemisphere long ago. For after the great war between the states, note that name, our people faced a desolate land of burned universities, destroyed crops and homes with manpower depleted and crippled. And even the mule, which was required to work the land, was so scarce the whole community shared one animal to make the spring plowing. There were no government handouts, no Marshall Plan aid, no coddling to make sure that our people would not suffer. Instead, the South was set upon by the vulturous carpetbagger and the federal troops. All loyal Southerners were denied the right to vote at the point of bayonet so that the infamous illegal 14th Amendment might be passed. There was no food, no money, and no hope of either. But our grandfathers bent their knee only in church and bowed their head only to God. Now, note how Wallace portrays the South as the true freedom-loving patriots victims of the war, who laid claim on the American Revolution, now using that language to deny the federal government and defy the federal government. Does any of that sound familiar? You bet it does. And note that the 14th Amendment is illegal. Um, was his objection to Section 1? All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection in the laws. 
or was his objection to Section 3? No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president, vice president, or hold any office civil or military on the United States or any other state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or an officer of the United States or any member of the state legislature or executive or judicial officer of the state to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in, in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof? Uh, Mr. Wallace. And now for something completely different. We'll turn to Angelina Grimke, famed Congregationalist advocate for the abolition of slavery in the middle of the 19th century, the equality of blacks and whites, and women's rights. She addressed Southern Christian women in an 1836 speech. One could see her words as using the full power of her place within the hierarchy to, su to subvert essential elements of the hierarchy. She said, perhaps you'll be ready to query, why, why appeal to women on the subject? We do might not make the laws which perpetuate slavery. No legislative power is vested in us. We can do nothing to overthrow the system, even if we wish to do so. To this I reply, I know you do not make the laws, but I also know you are wives and mothers, the sisters and daughters of those who do. And if you really suppose you can do nothing to overthrow slavery, you are greatly mistaken. You can do much in every way. Four things I will name. First, you can read on the subject. Second, you can pray over the subject. Third, you can speak on the subject. And fourth, you can act on the subject. I have not placed reading before praying, or be because I regard it more important, but because in order to pray right, we must understand what we are praying for. It is only when we can pray with understanding that, and the Spirit also, which is to me spoken like eternally pro-study women's groups I've known and admired in churches over the years. Can you not, my dear friends, understand the signs of the times? Do you not see the sword of retributive justice hanging over the South? Are you still slumbering at your posts? Are there no shipras, no puas among you who will dare in Christian firmness and Christian meekness to refuse to obey wicked laws which require women to enslave, to degrade, and to brutalize women? Are there no Miriams who would rejoice to lead out the captive daughters of the southern states to liberty and light? Are there no Huldas there who will dare to speak the truth concerning the sins of the people and those judgments, which it requires no prophet's eye to see, but follow if uh, repentance is not speedily sought? And I'm going to insert here, I would have thought Ms. Grimpty took Dr. Lisa Davison's course on women in the Bible. She does quite well. Is there no Esther among you who will plead for the poor, devastated slave? Yes, if there were but one Esther at the South, we might save her country from ruin. But let the Christian women there arise, as the Christian women of Great Britain did, in the majesty of moral power. And that salvation is certain. Let them embody themselves in societies and send petitions up to their different legislatures, entreating their husbands, fathers, brothers, and sons to abolish the institution of slavery, no longer to subject woman to the scourge and the chain, to mental darkness and moral degradation, no longer to tear husbands from their wives and children from their parents, no longer to make men, women, and children work without wages, no longer to make their lives bitter and hard bondage, no longer to reduce American citizens to the abject condition of slaves, of chattels personnel, no longer to barter the image of God in human shambles for corruptible things such as silver and gold. Slavery must be attacked with the whole power of truth and the sword of the spirit. You must take it up on Christian ground and fight against it with Christian weapons whilst your feet are shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. And you are now loudly called upon by the cries of the widow and orphan to arise and gird yourselves for this great moral conflict with the whole armor of righteousness upon the right hand and upon the left. Now, here's a section of a speech all Americans and certainly all Christians in America should know. The speech was written by Frederick Douglass to a group of white people who asked him to address them on the 4th of July. Sit back, the quote's a little lengthy, but I'm merely citing that part of his address 
in which he treated white Christians and their churches and what Douglas ferociously believed to be the church's utter moral failing in response to the recently enacted fugitive slave law. In Douglas, you will find no support for hierarchy and no comfort for those who want to keep Christianity in the home and out of the public sphere. In glaring violation of justice and shameless disregard of the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless and in diabolical intent, this fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. I take this law to be one of the grossest infringements of Christian liberty, and if the churches and ministers of our country were not stupidly blind or most wickedly indifferent, they too would so regard it. At the very moment they are thanking God for the enjoyment of civil and religious liberty and for the right to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciousness, they are utterly silent in respect to a law which robs religion of its chief significance and makes it utterly worthless to a world lying in wickedness. Did this law concern the mint, anise, and cumin, abridge the right to sing psalms, to partake of the sacrament, or to engage in any of the ceremonies of religion, it would have been smitten by the thunder of a thousand pulpits. A general shout would go up from the church, demanding repeal, repeal, instant repeal. And it would go hard with that politician who presumed, presumed to solicit the votes of the people without inscribing this motto on his banner. The fact that the church of our country, with fractional exceptions, does not assume the fugitive slave law as a declaration of war against religious liberty implies that the church regards religion simply as a form of worship, an empty ceremony, and not a vital principle requiring active benevolence, justice, love, and goodwill towards man. It esteems sacrifice above mercy, psalm singing above right doing, solemn meetings above practical righteousness. One hears Amos in this. But the church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of slavery, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery and the shield of American slave hunters. Many of its most eloquent divines who stand as the very lights of the church have shamelessly given the sanction of religion in the Bible to the whole slave system. They have taught that man may properly be a slave, that the relation of master and slave is ordained of God, that to send back an escaped bondsman to his master is clearly the duty of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this horrible blasphemy is palmed off upon the world for Christianity. For my part, I would say, welcome infidelity, welcome atheism, welcome anything in preference to the gospel as preached by those divines. Those ministers make religion a cold and flinty-hearted thing having neither principles of right action nor balls of compassion. They strip the love of God of its beauty and leave the throng of religion in a huge, horrible, repulsive form. It is a religion for oppressors, tyrants, man-stealers, and thugs. And I'm saying here, that's quite a hierarchy, right? Now bear, now hear the hierarchy he condemns in the name of Jesus. A religion which fears, which favors the rich against the poor, which exalts the proud above the humble, which divides mankind into two classes, tyrants and slaves, which says to the man in chains, stay there, and to the oppressor, oppress on, is a religion which may be professed and enjoyed by all the robbers and slavers of mankind. It makes God a respecter of persons, denies his fatherhood of the race, and tramples in the dust the great truth of the brotherhood of man. All this we affirm to be true of the popular church and the popular worship of our land and nation, a religion, a church, and a worship which, on the authority of inspired wisdom, we pronounce to be an abomination in the sight of God. In the language of Isaiah, the American church might well be addressed, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot uh, away with. It is iniquity even the solemn meeting your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth 
They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge for the fatherless. Plead for the widow. The American church is guilty when viewed in connection with what is going on to uphold slavery. It is superlatively guilty when viewed with its connection with its ability to abolish slavery. The sin of which it is guilty is one of omission as one of commission. Let the religious press, the pulpit, the Sunday school, the conference meeting, the great ecclesiastical missionary Bible and tract societies of the land array their immense powers against slavery and slaveholding, and the whole system of crime and blood would be scattered to the winds. And that they do not do this involves them in the most awful responsibility of which the mind can conceive. One is struck with the difference between the attitude of the American church toward the anti-slavery movement and that occupied by the churches in England toward a similar movement in that country. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation, as embodied in the two great political parties, is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. You hurl your anathemas at the crowned-headed tyrants of Russia and Austria, and you pride yourself on your democratic institutions, while you yourselves consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad, honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land, you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You glory in your refinement and your universal education, and yet you maintain a system as barbarous and dreadful as ever stained the character of a nation, a system begun in avarice, supported in pride, and perpetuated in cruelty. I challenge you to give that sermon on the 4th of July. Include it in its fullness in every high school textbook. Do these things and you'll see the power of hierarchy in response. Now I'm going to shift from race and color to women. Hear these voices of women who felt and fought against the patriarchal hierarchy that kept women in their places. You can get a good feel for the patriarchy they argue against as well as the equality which they expect. I'm going to use just one example of a man opposing women's suffrage. California State Senator J.B. Sanford was his state's point person in 1911 to defeat a bill giving women the vote. Sanford wastes no time citing the divine hierarchy when he said, suffrage is not a right, it's a privilege that may or may not be granted. Politics is no place for a woman, consequently the privilege should not be granted to her. The mother's influence is needed in the home. She can do little good by gadding the streets and neglecting her children. Let her teach her daughters that modesty, patience, and gentleness are the charms of a woman. Let her teach her sons that an honest conscience is every man's first political law, that no splendor can rob him nor force justify the surrender of the simplest right of a free and independent citizen. The mothers of this country can shape the destinies of the nation by keeping in their places and attending to those duties that God Almighty attended for them. The kindly, gentle influence of the mother in the home and the dignified influence of the teacher in the school will far outweigh all the influence of the mannish female politicians on earth. The courageous, chivalrous, and manly men and the womanly women, the real mothers and home builders of the country, are opposed to this innovation in American political life. The men are able to run the government and take care of the women. Do women have to vote in order to receive the protection of man? Why, men have gone to war endured every privation and death itself in defense of woman. To man, woman is the dearest creature on earth, and there's no extreme to which he would not go for his mother or sister. 
By keeping woman in her exalted position, man can be induced to do more for her than he could by having her mix up in affairs that will cause him to lose respect and regard for her. Woman does not have to vote to secure her rights. Man will go to any extreme to protect and elevate her now. As long as woman is woman and keeps her place, she will get more protection and more consideration than man gets. When she abdicates her throne, she throws down the scepter of her power and loses her influence. Okay, now imagine each of the following women rebuking Mr. Sanford. First, Abigail Adams. Right into her husband John as the men were sequestered in Philadelphia trying to vote or not on independence. Abigail's words have been remembered for her Remember the Ladies line. I long to hear that you have declared an independency and by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to, to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That your sex is naturally tyrannical is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit of no dispute. But such of you as wish to be happy willingly give up the harsh title of master for the more tender and enduring one of friend, which I'm hearing there echoes of Jesus with his disciples in John saying you're not servants but friends. Why then not put it out of the power of the vicious and lawless to use us with cruelty and, and indignity with impunity? Men of sense in all ages abhor those customs which treat us only as the vassals of your sex. Regard us then as beings placed by providence under your protection and in imitation of the supreme being. Make use of that power only for our happiness. Now, many of you will know Sojourner Truth's famous Ain't I a Woman speech given to a woman's rights convention in Akron, Ohio. This is a speech about power, a self-claimed power, rather than anything granted to her by a man. Well, children, there, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women in the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages over mud puddles or gives me any place, best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I've plowed and planted and gathered in barns and no man could head me. And today, ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most of them sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? The little man in black over there says, women can't have as much rights as a man because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and from a woman. Man had nothing to do with him, which is one of the most famous slapdowns of Christian patriarchy ever. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking uh, to do it, and men better let them. Then there's the introduction from the Women's Bible, edited by first wave feminist leader Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Stanton was raised a Christian but became a free thinker, largely because of patriarchy. Nonetheless, she saw the power the Bible held in holding women down and back. This again from the introduction. From the inauguration of the movement for women's emancipation, the Bible has been used to hold her in the divinely ordained sphere prescribed in the Old and New Testaments, the canon and civil law, church and state, priests and legislators, all political parties and religious denominations have alike taught that woman was made after man, of man, and for man, an inferior being subject to man. Creeds, codes, scriptures, and statutes are all formed on this basis. The fashions, forms, ceremonies, and customs of society 
church ordinances and discipline all grow out of this idea. The Bible teaches that woman brought sin and death into the world, that she participated the fall of the race, that she, has arra she was arraigned before the judgment seat of heaven, tried, condemned, and sentenced. Marriage for her was to be a condition of bondage, maternity, a position, uh, a period of suffering and anguish, and in silence and subjection, she was to play the role of a dependent on man's bounty for all her material wants and for all the information she might desire and the vital question of the hour. She was commanded to ask her husband at home. Here is the Bible position of women briefly summed up. Those who have the divine insight to translate, transpose, and transfigure this mournful object of pity into an exalted, dignified personage worthy of worship as the mother of the race are to be congratulated as having a share of the occult mystic power of the Eastern Mahatmas. So perverted is the religious element of her nature that with faith and work she is the chief support of the church and the clergy, the very powers that make her emancipation impossible. When, in the early part of the 19th century, women began to protest against their civil and political degradation, they were referred to the Bible for an answer. When they protested against their unequal position in the church, they were referred to the Bible for an answer. This led to a general and critical study of the scriptures. Some, having made a fetish of these books and believing them to be the veritable word of God, with liberal translations, interpretations, allegories, and symbols, glossed over the most objectionable features of the various books and clung to them as divinely inspired. Others, seeing the family resemblance between the Mosaic Code, the Canon Law, and the Old English Common Law, came to the conclusion they all alike emanated from the same source, wholly human in their origin, and inspired by the natural love of domination in the historians. Others, bewildered with their doubts and fears, came to no conclusion. While their clergymen told them on the one hand that they owed all the blessings and freedom they enjoyed to the Bible, and the other, they said it clearly marked out their, circum their circumscribed uh, sphere of action, that the demands for political and civil rights were irreligious, dangerous to the stability of the home, the state, and the church. Clerical appeals were circulated from time to time, conjured, uh, conjuring members of their churches to take no part in the anti-slavery women's suffrage movements, as they were infidel in their tendencies, undermining the various foundations of society. No wonder the majority of women stood still and with bowed heads accepted their situation. Next to last, here's Sally McFaig again on the problems with God as monarch and father. In the monarchical model, there is no concern for the cosmos, for the non-human world. Here is our second objection to this model. It is simply blank in terms of what lies outside the human sphere. As a political model focused on governing human beings, it leaves out most of reality. One could say at this point that, as with all models, it has limitations and needs to be balanced by other models. Such a comment does not address the seriousness of the mon monarchical model's power, for as the dominant Western model, it has not allowed competing models to arise. In other words, hierarchy that limits other hierarchies. The tendency, rather, has been to draw other models into its orbit, as is evident with the model of God as Father. This model could have gone in the direction of parent, as clearly its New Testament course, with associations of nurture, care, guidance, and responsibility. But under the powerful influence of the monarchical model, the parent becomes the patriarch, and patriarchs act more like king than like fathers. They rule their children and they demand obedience. The monarchical model is not only highly anthropocentric, but it supports a kind of anthropocentrism characterized by dualistic hierarchies. We not only imagine God in our image, but those images we use for imaging God also become our standards for human behavior. Dualistic, triumphalistic thinking fuels many forms of oppression. While the monarchical model may not be responsible alone for hierarchical dualism, it has supported it. The dualism of male-female, spirit-nature, human-non-human, Christian-non-Christian, rich-poor, white-colored, and so forth. The hierarchical dualistic pattern is so widespread in Western thought that it is often not perceived to be a pattern, but it's felt to be simply the way things are. It appears natural to many that whites, males, the rich, and Christians are superior to other human beings. 
and that human beings are more valuable in all respects than other forms of life. Now I'm going to give the last word to Martin Luther King Jr. The following is from his speech Beyond Vietnam he gave in April 4, 1967. The location was Riverside Church in New York, funded by Rockefeller oil money. King gained a substantial number of critics for giving this speech, including from the civil rights camps and his political and ecclesiastical friends. Famously in this speech, King linked racism, poverty, and militarism. His critics thought he was wrong to broaden the issues and to wade in so deeply into opposition to the Vietnam War. That critique, that it is a strategic error to broaden a cause, has ever been leveled against those who see the connections between forms of oppression and feel compelled to address them together. Detractors fiercely criticized Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony for opposing the 14th and 15th Amendments as written because they excluded women from voting rights again. So, from Dr. King's speech. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who said in darkness have seen a great light, he's echoing Isaiah. We in the West must support those revolutions. It's a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, a morbid fear of communism, and our proneness to adjust to injustice, the Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the arch anti-revolutionaries. This has driven many to feel that only Marxism has a revolutionary spirit. And by the way, I would say that the same about um, hierarchy, hierarchy propping Christianity. Christianity is viewed too much as pro-law and order rather than as a leaven for a revolutionary kind of love in every culture. Back to King. Therefore, communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real and follow through on the revolutions that we initiated. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile, hostile world, declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and unjust mores, and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill be made low, and the crooked sh place shall be made straight, and the rough places made plain, echoing, of course, Isaiah. A genuine revolution of values means, in the final analysis, that our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to humankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. And religious people in every nation who have tried to move their nation's needle in the ecumenical direction have not succeeded yet with catastrophic consequences already evident. Centrifugal forces have ruled the globe since soon after the end of World War II. Do you doubt where Dr. King would stand regarding the ultimate hierarchy of America first? So in all of this, we've heard a tiny sampling from Christians and from free-thinking Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who either supported a racial hierarchy with all their Christian learning or sought the level hierarchies of race and gender, also with the power of their Christian convictions. When it comes to America's social hierarchies, Christians have nurtured both a vision of equality and a vision of limited rule reserved for those whom God ordained to govern cultural, religious, and political life. On balance, one might argue the conservative position regarding hierarchies is more widespread than the leveling position. Well, now that would be a good topic for our discussion. Feel free to email your questions and comments to me. Thanks for your attention. I will look forward to talking.